Uh, when we're doing these, we try to not just hone to one to one theme, not just to, it's very easy for an evening of siege to just do all history all night, but we really like to branch out into our history, science, art, and adventure, and I'm very appreciative of Alexander for bringing in the arts to this, to this storyline, and he is going to be talking this evening about California's siege of Edison, movie outlaws, and the original patent trolls. Please welcome Alexander to the stage. There we go. I have to say, I, I actually did plan on making a joke about, this is a nice lectern. <laughs> so I'll just go with the same joke, this is a nice lectern. <laughs> so I'll admit, this is a siege of, uh, shall we say, philosophical import or philosophical trope. Philosophy! Philosophy! <laughs> Sadly, I, I don't have any ships, so uh, yeah. very sorry. There is some science, though. Don't worry, don't worry. There's, it's, there's invention, so there is science. So the beginning of motion pictures is somewhat has its own questionable beginnings. The Zotrope was created by Edward Moybridge to settle a bet by Governor Leland Stanford about if all four hooves of the horse left the ground. So essentially, you have an entire mode of human expression that starts off a bet from a rich guy. What can go wrong after that? When you start off with that, really, what can go wrong? So the Zotrope continues on. It's a lovely curiosity. And it, of course, very quickly becomes a scientific medium. This is an anatomical study, not pictures of a nude woman or almost nude woman. See the lines? That means it's scientific. Science. So from these somewhat illicit to questionable at best beginnings, we end up with someone who legitimately wants to have skin in the game, wants the glory of bringing this to everyone, and wants everyone to see what movies can bring, what the moving pictures can do. Not the talking pictures yet, just the moving pictures. We enter Thomas Edison. Uh, I'll try and be objective, but let's face it, the guy's kind of a scumbag. Any of you from New Jersey, apparently he's idolized like a god if you're from New Jersey. No? Okay, good. Then I can trash New Jersey for the next 10 minutes. Great. <laughs> you, you are my people. You are my audience. So Edison is here with George Eastman of Eastman Kodak. They, Eastman comes up with the idea because, come on, you need to come up with a way of making money off this newfangled exciting thing. Who cares about what it can do? How do I make money off of it? Does this sound familiar to stuff that happens around this geographical area at all? No, no, you know, Bueller, Bueller, nobody, okay. So Edison comes up with a wall of patents. And a lot of the way that he does this is based on the light bulb. Because if you invented the light bulb, you like patents. Because they are the easiest way of lobbing people over the head and getting money out of them. It's not a protection racket, it's law. So this was the natural way of making a wall for him. This was his city. He was going to make the beautiful movie studio and film business center in New Jersey. More patents. The patents just go on and on and on. And they all look a lot the same, which is the funny part. All the patents for movie cameras look a lot the same. For those of you falling asleep, don't worry, this is not entirely a lecture about patent law. I, I'd like to stay awake for the rest of the night. So this is what's called the Latham Loop. And this was the first time when the, the phrase of, it's the flicks, you go and see a flick, was because the prior projector had a slit and it was mistimed. So the picture would flat out go black between frames. The Latham Loop was the first time that you could actually get the film to stop in place and your persistence of vision would make it look like the magical thing that it was. Somehow, that something moves that doesn't move at all. Your brain's lying to you. Sorry to tell you all that. <laughs> Here we have William Dickinson, who worked for Edison. This is a still of him from Dickinson's Greetings, which was the first movie ever shown to any large amount of people. It's about eight seconds long, and it pretty much consists of him doing that. He is why we can, 
he is who we can thank for that we have 35 millimeter film. He got 70 millimeter film, which was an existing film size, split it in half, and they used to make the perforations on it with a punch that was foot operated. So every single thousand foot roll of film involves some guy loading in a thing, hitting a thing, moving it five feet, hitting a thing. That's how they perforated film to start off with. The patent company pretty much includes all the big players because, you know, if you have patents, you want all of the evil people in one place. I mean, all of the interesting, talented people in one place. This seems like a great idea. Edison will make all the money there is to be made in film. Here's the problem. He approaches it like he's making light bulbs. They're all the same. They're realities. I kid you not, that's what they were called. And they were about as interesting as a lot of reality television now, which is to say, not at all. People walking into a room, greeting each other, having a cup of tea, the, the coasts, the, uh, the, raw, the waves on the coast. And they shoot most of these things to start off with in the Black Maria. I mean, come on, doesn't that look like an architecturally inspired building <laughs> that will create nothing but timeless masterpieces that are notable, not just because they're the first thing that happens. We end up with the great kiss of 96, not Titanic. This was protested all across the country. It was salacious. It was the degradation of morals. And Edison said this couldn't happen. That was too exciting. <laughs> really, that's what he said. So we also end up, so we end up with things like Jack and the Beanstalk. As you can tell, this is completely what ILM owes their heritage to. It's completely not two guys in a suit, right? No, no, not possible. So here's the thing. In order to enforce these patents, they controlled the amount of supplies you could buy, they controlled what you could do with them, and they controlled what you could say with them. Even though you paid for all the things, they got to tell you what it was you did with it. That's never happened since then. <laughs> but really, really, don't squeeze the bag. The dragons, the dragons will come out of the bag. Bad things will happen. Nothing can go wrong. Here was the biggest problem. The films just sucked. They were boring. They were interesting in that they were curiosities, but they just weren't that interesting. And after you'd seen the same one about 20 times, you didn't really want to go back. And the theater owner who had rented them, because you could only rent, not buy, said, well, we did just something else for me. You know, what about that one with the pretty girl with the curly hair? Oh no, you have to get this one next because that's what we say you get. That didn't work out real well for the theater owners. So they started getting things from Europe to fight the complete boredom they had in their theaters. Now we enter California. As Lucius Beebe said, the nut house run by the inmates. California's walls of defense include Siberia, the French Alps, the Wyoming ranches, the Kentucky mountains, the Red Sea, and the Sahara Desert. There is no way Edison's men are getting out here. Absolutely no way. This, though, is actually a 1910 map of Paramount telling you what you could fake. I, it, it, yeah, it actually is. Sherwood Forest, England seems a little off. I mean, you could kind of phone it in, but eh, whatever. So here's the thing. You get to California, it's 1900. Badges, we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> California has a much more lax approach to the issue of patents. The independents take advantage of this. The Ninth Circuit Court, which you'll recognize from just at Mission Street, plays into this. Mostly because, I kid you not, this starts off in a series of cases about the twine, you, the way you wrap twine around brooms. They kind of got this uh, patents, whatever. And they just became the, yeah, we're not going to really deal with that. So there we go. You end up with a place that has a somewhat soft, soft place for you to land that's far away from Edison. Note the taunting devil-like figure. <laughs> this company ends up becoming universal. It starts off at IMP, works to Nestor, works in, and you'll see in tiny type there, Universal Films. 
which apparently came from that he saw a pipe fitting truck that said Universal Pipe Fittings drive by as someone asked him what the name of his studio was. <laughs> Edison, of course, was never glib about anything. He would never, ever announce the, uh, his triumph of, an, of a foe. <laughs> At all. Wouldn't happen. And of course, this is where we end up where the story gets a bit foggy. Because these are people who make up stories and lie for a living, essentially. They build Universal City, partly as a way of getting around the patent trust, partly as their own small walled city. Which to this day, by the way, it's mostly an unincorporated Los Angeles County, so they don't have to deal with planning or city taxes in the city of Los Angeles, to this day. <laughs> this is Colonel Selig. You'll notice, by the way, he has much better props. He even lets them smoke. I mean, that's questionable these days, but back then that was, you know, you're nice to your gorilla. Exactly, I was progressive. Selig starts off in Chicago, ends up in California. His camera, this is his camera department when they got out to Los Angeles. Their easiest way of skirting the patents were that they kept a lot of extra cameras around so that when Edison's men showed up, the ones that they hadn't supposedly chased off with guns from the train station, they would just swap out the cameras or the guts of the cameras looked like they were a camera that didn't infringe but were and if it got really bad, they just loaded all the stuff on the back of a horse and shipped it to Mexico for the weekend. <laughs> Problem solved. Seelig ends up opening up a zoo incidentally in East Los Angeles and he wants to open up an amusement park and rides and essentially he makes a rough sketch for Disneyland in about 1915. He ends up losing all of his money in the depression. This is William Fox who was at the forefront of, quite frankly, sieging Edison and just generally pissing the guy off. He did this mostly by creating this lovely vamp, Theta Bera, who was Theosodia Goodman, and gave Fox the money to fight Edison's lawyers. Here's where the story gets really foggy. This story is always told as the siege of California upon Edison, and they did win. There are questionable, long-standing effects to this, Fox News. But this is where the story gets foggy. Cecil B. DeMille's first film was, unsurprisingly, a Western, which, by the way, Westerns didn't get a lot of play in Europe, kind of a selling problem. He was so scared, he said, of Edison's men, he became a lifelong gun nut. How much was this permitted? Paramount Studios had a gun shop in it a gun rental shop, until 1986. <laughs> when they ran out of space. That's the only reason why it left. And also less Westerns. Universal continues to expand their repertoire, as does Fox. The wide selection of films gets wider and wider to what we know as the lovely things you can get today in cinematic entertainment. But Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm looking at you still. The cord in the long run overturns the button fastener case, which was about shoe button fasteners, and how they gave you the machine to put together the button fasteners, but you had to buy the fasteners themselves from the button fastener company. Well, the court overturns this, and the Motion Picture Patent Trust, which was already dying its last gasp because, Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm looking at you, <laughs> came to an end. Edison, always trying to save face, or at least seem like the great American inventor that he was, always happy to be a part of technology. In 1924, when Universal Studios had its first electric soundstage, he came to the grand opening, because he did invent the light bulb after all. <laughs> so, to changing the story, to not quite telling the, what the truth is, but to what is at least the good story, don't let the facts get in the way, and to California. <laughs> We raise a glass. Uh, for any of you who are interested in exploring, the Bay Area had kind of a, a minor role in that whole rebellion against Edison. There's a silent film, or a, a, I think it's all dedicated to silent film. I think it's called the Silent Film Museum in Niles, Niles? Niles, um, and, there, and there's also, a, there, it's really close to the last remnants of the Southern Pacific Railroad. They have a little historic railroad thing, but they have a wonderful museum. It was Charlie Chaplin's um, 
studio space, and they have a nice little museum there that's kind of a cool miniature perspective on some of the West Coast shenanigans. Um, okay, so I would like to change the, the scene again. We're going to go back a few hundred years, and we're going to go back to that city-state era. Um, I, it is my honor to welcome to the stage one of the fellows of Odd Salon, but because his fellowship came through the fact that he films Odd Salon all the time, this is his first time on the stage. So, um, I'm really excited to welcome Ronnie to the stage to talk about Buckets and Bloodshed and the Battle of Zappolino. Please welcome Ronnie. Thank you, Anetta. Uh, let's see here. So it's actually funny. This whole thing starts with, uh, I was in vacation a couple weeks ago in Italy, and this old text sends me a text message that says, uh, I have a highly specific request for you. I need for you to get, uh, go to the town hall of Modena and get me a picture of the Sequia Rapita, or the stolen bucket. Um, it's this bucket that was stolen in 1325, and from there I start looking into this story. Um, and so this is the, uh, the War of the Bucket is the catchy name of this Battle of Zappolino, which took place on November 15th in 1325. All the versions that you really hear about this story is that the bucket was the premise for this, for this entire battle. It's the beginning of, um, of this conflict. Uh, this illustration is from Alessandro Tassini's heroic mock opera, uh, where we see uh, Spinamonte running away with a bucket, and it's in this action uh, that causes the war. Um, the battle is on many lists of the dumbest wars of all time, exactly because it's this idea of that someone, it's over a bucket. <laughs> Buckets! I'm going to use that again and again. Okay. <laughs> and so Spinamonte steal this bucket from, Mod from the Modenese. Uh, the Modenese steal this bucket, and then the Bolognese demand for the return of it, um, and then, uh, let's see. <laughs> I really like this drawing, so none of us, it's funny, like you sold, I was gonna ask her to do a drawing of this thing and then I found this thing on the internet randomly. Um, it kind of shows you how like people are really interested in this story even though it's this like 700 year old conflict. Um, <laughs> uh, so the Bolognese demand the return of the bucket and when Modena refuses, uh, the Bolognese decide that uh, it's had enough. Um, and so they uh, lay siege to Modena. Um, but it still begs this question of like, why so much uh, for this bucket. Um, in some versions of the story, the bucket was filled with loot, like gold. In other versions, uh, the Modenese raided Bologna and filled it with gold, and then uh, that's why it was so valuable. Um, but it's still widely depicted as sort of the last straw that broke the camel's back. And so the question is, what were the other straws? Like, what led to this thing? Why did it uh, become this like, massive uh, ordeal? Um, and so interestingly enough, this is not a depiction of the uh, Battle of Zappolino, uh, which this uh, talk is about, but this is the uh, 1176 uh, Battle of Legnano that started this conflict that would be the framework for which all of this stuff happens. Um, in, May 9, in May 29th of 1176, the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbosa, was defeated at the Battle of Legnano by the Lombard League, which supported the, with, supported by Pope Alexander. Um, so we have this uh, conflict between a Holy Roman Emperor and, uh, and the papacy. Um, and this was the start of a pro long protracted conflict in, the, in medieval Italy that would be between uh, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Um, the Guelphs are affiliated with Pope Alexander or the, pope, the papacy, and the Ghibellines are uh, affiliated with the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and sort of towns and regions sort of picked their sides um, uh, depending on who they were aligned with. Um, <clears throat> And so this war the, uh, between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines continued for another 350 years um, and only stopped uh, when Charles I of Spain seized the imperial power of Italy during the Italian wars. Uh, and faced with the threat of invasion, uh, they finally aligned and decided to uh, uh, team up against the Spanish. Um, so the Guelphs were the, and in this story, uh, the Guelphs are, uh, the Bolognese are the Guelphs and the Modenese who stole the bucket are uh, with the Ghibelline faction. Um, so this is the region of Italy where we're looking at here. Um, sort of, uh, these are our two towns. Uh, sorry, the northwest here is where the um, where Modena is, and you see Bologna there on the east. Um, and there's some mountain ranges uh, all down at the south. And so the story that we would hear, the typical story that we'd know, we'd have you believe, is that the Bolognese, uh, after the bucket was stolen, uh, raided Modena and went straight there and uh, laid siege to the town. Um, just to give you a little bit more context, uh, this is the, uh, where we are in Italy. Um, and zooming in a little bit further, this is the uh, mountain range uh, that splits uh, Italy at that 
point. And at the bottom, you see that Florence, uh, which was a major, major trading partner. And so control over the passes between these two lands is sort of a big deal. And so uh, you can see how uh, the fight between Modena and Bologna, uh, the Guelphs and the Gebelines, is this cultural thing, but it's also uh, rooted in finance and politics and all these things. Um, the Bolognese had a uh, pact with the with Florentines, and uh, they assisted them in battle. But um, uh, yeah, this was really about uh, a lot more than that. Um, so this is the town the towns again. Um, and this sort of heats up in 1296, the Bolognese successfully invade the Bolognese lands of Bizzano and Savigno. You see them there uh, in the south, right in the mountain regions there. There are two separate uh, regions. Uh, so you see that they're kind of right in the middle in between the two areas. Um, and so uh, Bizzano will come into play later on. Um, in September of 1325, uh, the Modenese uh, capture a stronghold of Monteveglio, that little yellow uh, beacon there. It's the top of a mountain, so it's right, uh, it's important strategically for you so that you can see, uh, you can control the trading paths as they're coming through. Um, in response to this, the Bolognese send 32,000 troops uh, to take back this castle. Um, initially, in the story that we're told is that the Bolognese invaded more than enough for this bucket, um, but here we're seeing that they actually uh, went back to get this uh, castle back. Um, it's interesting to note also that uh, the seizure of, the, of Monteveglio was in uh, September, in late September of 1325, and uh, the Bolognese sought to recapture it in, by early November, so pretty quickly assembled a force of 32,000 troops, 30,000 foot soldiers, and 2,000 cavalrymen who were described as being haphazardly armed. Uh, <laughs> and they were faced a, a much, much smaller force uh, that included three major captains, uh, and one of them was the Azione of Visconti of Milan, who had uh, a band of professional German troops that are basically the prototype for what we know as barbarians. So they had a very highly trained uh, force, although they were a lot smaller. Um, so the Bolognese uh, forces are stationed back here after they've received Monteveglio. Um, and then they see um, very shortly after that that there is a, uh, a coming approach. So at the north there near Modena you see uh, the Ponte de Sant'Ambrogio uh, and lower in the south there you see Bizzano, which interestingly enough Bizzano is where there was the, um, the initial seizure. So you can kind of see how the Bolognese would imagine that they're on their way back and they're taking their towns and also coming back to grab uh, uh, Monteveglio again. Here's a uh, better view of it. Um, you see that uh, the Roca de Monteveglio, which is a stronghold, is at the top of this mountain. So you can see people coming from a long uh, distance. So you can see why it's important. Um, and here you see where the other two regions were, where the, uh, uh, the Modenese were ostensibly coming from. Um, but what they didn't know is that the Modenese were actually stationed down here directly to their west the entire time. And so while they sent a lot of troops all the way to the north to sort of hold off the advance, um, the Modenese attacked and surprised them and quickly captured all of their leaders and their best men who were holding back waiting for this big fight that was coming that never happened. Um, and so the battle actually takes place here. That star right there at the bottom is Zappolino, which the battle is named after. Um, so there was no raid on Modena. It was here in Zappolino where this fight took place. And so the Modenese take uh, the, uh, the Bolognese very easily. And they f the Bolognese forces flee all the way back to Bologna quickly because they have no leaders to tell them what to do. And along the way, the Modenese destroy six more castles on the way to, the, to Bologna. They're taking and sieging and destroying everything. Um, they also destroy um, the Chiusa del Reno nel Casalecchio, uh, which is a, uh, um, basically like a dam that diverts uh, the water supply to the city. So they're, a, a large part of this, uh, these medieval conflicts is that there were these giant walled cities and if you couldn't take the city itself, you could attack uh, all of the resources that they had outside. And a lot of it was, food, agricultural um, things, but this was uh, sort of a direct hit um, to their resources by destroying their water supply, at least in the short term. Um, and so in the middle of this great battle that they're still fighting, um, the next thing that they decide to do is um, <laughs> hold a palio. A palio is a traditional Italian athletic contest with horse racing, archery, uh, jousting, crossbows, and 
crossbow shooting and all other kinds of medieval sports. They basically held some games with people in costumes uh, to sort of mock the Bolognese who are inside basically routed um, and all of their uh, major troops are, are captured. Um, and so the Palio is right there. You see it right, um, right next to where the town of Bologna is outside of the gates. Um, and this is where we really see where it is here that the, at the tail end of the battle that the bucket was stolen from the westernmost gate and the outer walls of uh, Bologna at the Porta San Felice. It's just the last portal before you enter in the city. Um, and the Bolognese took it back to their own town and put it in the top of this tower. Um, <laughs> and they held it at the top there for 600 years. It was only taken down in 1911 to put a replica there so that they could bring it inside and have the thing inside in their town hall. Um, so it lived hung there for anyone who wanted to come look at it uh, for hundreds of years. Um, and so it sort of begs the question, like, how did this story that we know about the Sekia Rapita, how did this become the, you know, the, the major story that we know? Well, the interesting thing to note is that uh, this was written by Alessandro Tassani uh, in 1611 and was first published in Paris in 1622. So full 300 years after this conflict took place, someone wrote about it. Um, and you can kind of imagine that um, this bucket was not necessarily, um, it might not have been the cause of the war, but after having been held there for so 600 years, that it um, became a sort of a source of ire between these two towns, that it became like increasing. Um, and it's interesting, even though this is sort of a mock opera, kind of like Homer's Odyssey, but a satirical, the onion version of that thing. <laughs> Um, uh, Tassoni is still a beloved character for having written this uh, major work uh, that, for the, which the town is known. Um, this is a statue of Tassoni um, right outside. The, it's, um, the building to the right there is the base of the tower where the tower was, the base of the tower where the bucket was held for 600 years. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I took this photograph because I went to the town myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this is the other side of the... Um, of the of that entire structure, um, you can see the tower uh, looming on the on the back left corner there, um, that with that beautiful rose window. This church was uh, this um, this is the Duomo di Modena. In 1997, it was uh, set up as a uh, recognized as a universe as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it was this beautiful rose window and it had this um, it's tremendous beautiful inside, um, and it was it served there as a. Um, it was kind of a guide for travelers and, uh, and tradesmen who were tr uh, trading along these routes. When you reach this uh, spectacular building, you knew where you were. Um, so not only was it where all these people passed through, but that bucket hung up there the entire time for all those years. Um, so I went to the town hall right here, uh, which because of this uh, UNESCO uh, heritage site, it has, um, it is a, the town hall is also a United Nations Information Center. Um, so I walked up to this counter with my like Google Translate and my phone like, pronounce this right, don't fuck this up. Um, I went up to say, I asked her and she like looked, greeted me kind of sternly and I said, la sequia rapita and she got really excited. Like <laughs> she got wavy hands excited. It was kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And so she passes me off to this other guy and he like doesn't give a shit and kind of just walks us upstairs and very casually just goes, okay, just go in there. And we're confronted with this. Um, <laughs> so we see this thing and the first thing I think is I want to drop everything I have, grab this bucket and run away with it. Because it's just like, I just want to do this thing. I get the fuck out of here. Um, but here it is, it's this, you know, it's this great thing. It's this entire hall where they have all these historical uh, relics from, from the town of Modena, and this bucket is like so proudly pronounced. Um, and it's funny, when we were doing the research for this thing, I really wanted to find out like what was the source of this thing, you know, kind of trying to get a sense of where it was. And after all this research, I decided to go back to my photos, and I found that I actually took a photograph of the placard in front of it, um, where it says, uh, displayed in the center of the room after centuries of being jealously guarded by the Geraldina Tower, is the famous Sekir Rapita, the war trophy of which the Modenese snatched from the uh, Bolognese during the Battle of Zabolino. Um, so that is me when I said, oh my god, this thing has been in front of me the entire time and I didn't bother to look. Um, <laughs> So it's just this bucket that was this, you know, it just lays there in state. It's, I think people really want this to be true, even though all the information is really there and all the articles you see about 
conflicting stories about the origin of the bucket and why it was stolen. There was a bucket stolen after. So all the information is there, but people still want it to be uh, what uh, this simple story about a bucket that caused the war. I mean, it's so easily understood that it just lives as this as, and not some messy centuries old um, political pissing contest between two warring factions in Italy. I think we love the concept of a conflict in which 30,000 people fought over this one tiny relic. Um, and they sent 32,000 people uh, to fight and where 2,000 people went to their deaths and they still didn't get this bucket back. Um, <laughs> I mean, even the, in the end, even though I was sort of led into this with the quick uh, clickbait headline version of the story, um, I was left with this really intense glimpse of this complicated medieval saga. And uh, so here's to all the uh, pithy, maybe not exactly totally real stories that we hear that lead us to these fascinating quarters of history and all Italian halls. I feel like there was one very important fact left out. What was the name of the character? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if you're looking for truth in the, uh, the poem of La Secchia Rapita, you should look really no further than the most notable character, which is the Conte de Colunia, uh, also known in English as the Count of Assland. Um, <laughs> So that'll tell you how uh, much we should really trust that story. A hint to veracity. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> All right, we have one more talk coming up. I'm going to welcome to the stage Trey, another one of our partners at Odd Salon. Um, and she is going to be talk about a story that began in World War II and didn't end until well into the Cold War. She's going to talk about one man siege, and I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, so I'm going to leave it to Trey. Here you go. Thanks, Trey. So because I also don't know how to pronounce anyone's name pretty much ever, particularly not French names, I'm a little bit better at Japanese names because the pronunciation is actually easy. I asked Jenny, so a quick shout out to Jenny in our audience who actually knows how to speak Japanese. Um, <laughs> so uh, this whole story that I'm really excited to present tonight because I've been like basically accosting people in bars about it for the last mm, month came because I was reading a self-help book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck and this story was in it. Well, a, like a really truncated not so accurate version of this story. So here we go. It is 1974. So to give you some context, the Whalers have just broken up in a fairly messy breakup and Bob Marley has launched his solo career. Barbara Streisand is topping the charts with the way we were. <laughs> and Watergate has basically just exploded. Nixon has become the first, hopefully not the last, president to resign. <laughs> And the U.S. is pretty like, oh, fuck. And polyester is king. Um, in, in more serious tones, despite the fact that the U.S. has pulled out of Vietnam, the Vietnam War is actually still going and is rounding out its time. Uh, also, MASH is now playing in its second year, which is about a war that had already ended. Uh, all this time, and did this actually... Doing it? Okay, uh, this is my super high tech. Look at what I did. No, go back. Okay, so all this time there is a man in a small island, that island, still fighting World War II. Wait, what? No, seriously. Animations are hard. No, go back. Okay, so um, no, seriously. So Hiro Odono was declared dead in 1959. We're nowhere near 1959, we're decades after that. And, uh, but he kept pillaging villages with his men and burning crops and stealing cattle and as a consequence fighting with the police. And now it's 1974 and the last of his troops are dead and he's still fighting the war. That has been ended for a really long time. Meanwhile, back in Japan, there is this hippie kid, self-proclaimed explorer, but let's get real, he was just a hippie kid who had kind of rich parents, and so he had money, and so he was exploring the world. And he had decided to go out and find Hiro, a panda, 
and the abominable snowman. No one took him seriously. I mean, would you? He was looking for the abominable snowman. And his plan to find Hiro, not the snowman, was brilliantly simple. He was going to go to the island, and he was going to wander through the jungle yelling his name. Hiro! Hiro! Yeah, that was, that was his plan. And he wonder why no one thought he was real? So he drops himself off in this island, and he is there, a young hippie kid, uh, and he is hunting a trained killer who has escaped the police and the military for 30 years, simply by yelling his name. That's his plan. After four days, it fucking worked! <laughs> Stupid plans work. <laughs> and later, Hiro would say this. This hippie boy, Suzuki, came to the island to listen to the feelings of a Japanese soldier. He asked me why I wouldn't go home. I said, if the war is over and I receive an order telling me to stop fighting, I would come out. He doesn't believe the war is over. Seriously. Doesn't believe so. So let's take a step back and try to get into the head of a man who has been fighting a 30-year war and understand why he doesn't believe the war is over. So in December of 1944, Hiro, who is 22 years old and an intelligence officer, very highly trained, and many other men, men are dropped off onto this island. And they are given an order to lay siege to this island by way of guerrilla warfare, to never surrender, to never kill themselves, and to continue to fight or survive off the land for as long as they have to. Um, let's be clear, December 1944, the war didn't look good for the Japanese. They just sent a whole bunch of really young men to an island and told them to never surrender and to never kill themselves, which is the socially acceptable way out. They were on a suicide mission in which suicide was not a possibility. So Otona and his men waged guerrilla warfare and they cut off food supplies and they killed cows and they killed men and they waged siege warfare in a guerrilla fashion to this island. Um, but three months later, the Allied forces show up and take the island, and in fact take the Philippines, and kill and capture nearly all of the men that were there. The surviving group retreat to the hills and they begin to ration food and bullets and make a plan. They're going to live off of very, very rationed rice, so small amounts of rice. They are going to eat coconuts, which any Californian will tell you is the cure-all for everything. And they are going to steal cows when they need to, and they're going to continue on with their mission. August 6th, the first bomb drops on Hiroshima. August 9th, the second bomb drops on Nagasaki. August 15th, Japan surrenders. And August, uh, September 2nd, formal documents are drawn up ending Japanese involvement in the war. But Otono and his men don't know this, or perhaps they don't believe this, and they continue to hide in the jungle and carry out their orders. And the locals, frankly, are fucking sick of it. Their cows are being killed, they're getting killed, their fields are being burned, and their supplies are destroyed. And let's face it, they have been part of a war that fucking sucked. And they're like, dude, the war is over, go the fuck home. But these men continue to do this. And so this is when the first leaflets fall from the sky. And I'd like you to imagine, you're on an island, hiding in the jungle, eating coconut and rice and a little bit of cow meat when you can get it. And there are leaflets falling from the sky that say, the war ended in August 1945, come out of the jungle. Would you believe it? Would you believe it? if your entire existence was wrapped up in the idea that you would never surrender? The men didn't. They thought it was a ploy. They thought it was the enemy coming to them and trying to draw them out. They would not surrender, and they continued to move forward. They knew that if the war truly was over, that their commanding officer would fly in and tell them. 
So for months, and then years, and then decades, these men survived in the jungle. They rationed their food supplies, they escaped from the police, and they ignored all signs that the war was over. And these signs were many. There was no Japanese soldiers on the island. There was no, in fact, really military on the island. There was police. There was a huge cultural shifts on this island that happened after a war. And leaflets were dropping from the motherfucking sky. It wasn't just once. They kept doing this. They kept trying to convince these men to come out. But they would never abandon their mission. Never. But one by one, the men were killed by police, by farmers. One of them wandered off and later surrendered. And in December 14th, 1972, 28 years later, the last of Otono's men died. They had come out of the jungle to burn a rice field, still carrying out their original order to lay siege to this island by guerrilla warfare, by cutting off the supplies and starving the people out. And a policeman saw them, shot, and Kozaka died. Okuno escaped back into the jungle, and there he was, alone with his thoughts, and alone with his 28-year mission. But it turns out, funny this, that when a soldier that was long thought dead dies, it hits the news, and fairly fast, and comes back to Japan. And this is where Norio uh, Suzuki heard of Otono for the first time, and then he sent out on his mission to find Hiro, a panda, and the abominable snowman, <laughs> in that order. And even though Suzuki did find Otono and became quite good friends with him during the time that he spent on the island, Otono still did not believe that the war was over and he refused to surrender. After 30 years, his sole self-worth, his entire belief system was wrapped up in the fact that this war was happening, that his mission was important to his emperor and his culture a culture that he loved very much, and he refused to go back to Japan. He wanted his superior officer to come to him. Luckily, his superior officer wasn't dead, long since retired. And so he came to the island, he returned, and gave these orders. The orders to stand down. The truth that the war was over. And this is what Hiro wrote in his autobiography of that moment. For the first time, I realized there was no subterfuge. This was no trick. Everything that I had heard was real. There was no secret message. The pack became heavier still. We really lost the war. How could we have been so sloppy? Suddenly, everything went black. A storm of rage was inside of me. I felt like a fool. Worse than that, what had I been doing for all of these years? He surrendered. He surrendered his rifle that still worked. Yeah, your shoes fall apart. <laughs> rifle still going, he still maintained it. The bullets he still had that he had rationed and stolen. And finally, his sword in a formal ceremony to the president of the Philippines who pardoned him for his considerable post war crimes. <laughs> Let's not hero worship Hiro. He killed 30 people after the war was done. He burned countless fields. He made people starve. This was not a man who was doing amazing heartfelt things and hiding in the jungle. He was still waging war. And so he surrendered. But at home in Japan, they were looking for a hero, or a hero, and found Hiro. He was welcomed back with open arms. He was given a massive pension, which he refused. He was very popular. <laughs> but this, this isn't his Japan. Imagine stepping back 30 years and then coming today in one day, imagine the horror you would feel in all of that technological advancement, but for, 
you can just squeeze the juice back. And here he is in this Japan that he doesn't remember, in this Japan that he didn't fight for, in this Japan that doesn't have the same culture, that doesn't have the same pride. And he would say later in his autobiography, once you have burned your tongue on hot soup, you blow on even cold sushi. And this is how the Japanese government behaved toward the US and other nations. He was hugely disenchanted. And even though he was a hero at home, he was miserable. After fighting this war for 30 years that was already over long before, he had returned to a country that simply was not his. So he retired. He retired to Brazil to be a cattle rancher, to escape this modern world in a simpler world. He later became a survival instructor, teaching skills because clearly he had them. <laughs> and he is still considered a hero. And when he passed, there was news stories everywhere. Later in life, he would tell reporters, I became an officer, I received an order. If I could not carry it out, I would feel shame. I am very competitive. <laughs> Hiro passed away only a few years ago in 2014 at the age of 91. And today I would like to raise a glass to survival, to competitiveness, and to Hiro. So many of the stories that we have up here on the stage start with misinformation or badly told stories or snippets that we see on, on websites. And I really love that this is an opportunity for people to dig in and find the real stories behind these things. So I would like to raise the last of my glass to all of tonight's speakers for the research that they put into all of these stories and digging into the truth. Even though we know that we're only telling, we're only telling our own version of the truth, but we're, we're trying to find the truth through storytelling. So thank you to all of you guys for tonight. And thank you to all of you who came out for this evening. Um, real quick, I want to talk about what's coming up next. We're going to be back here again in two weeks for stories of hustlers and gamers and schemers and rackets. We are going to have Odslan Swindle on Tuesday, May 16th. It's curated by one of our fellows, Marcy Bennett. It's her first curation, so you can come out and check that out. And then in um, June, we have Mutiny and Crackpot. And then coming up in July, we will have uh, Stolen. So those are the next few themes. I know at least a couple of them are up on the website. The rest of them will be up in the next few days. But you can grab advanced tickets at a discount at the merch table if you would like. In the meantime, the bar is open. Stick around. Talk to the speakers. If you'd like to speak, introduce yourself to me or one of the fellows. And uh, we will be posting follow-up links and information on our social Facebook group. Facebook group, uh, something weird. So you can join us there. If you have your favorite siege stories or other things that you'd like to share, you can join us there and we'll post the follow-up reading and all that kind of stuff. So thank you all for coming out tonight and we'll see you next time.